Hey, this is Conlin. I did a lot of R&D for camera matching for a 3D scene matching to a photograph, uh, specifically in the context for the midterm for the intro to 3D with Maya class at Nomen. Uh, and I thought I'd share what I learned so that everyone can kind of benefit from the research that I did. I thought I knew how to match a camera perfectly uh, to a photograph before I did all this research, and it turns out I was very wrong. So even if you think that you do too, um, maybe skim through this video and make sure you're not missing anything. Um, and I tried to be as thorough as possible, but I could have missed things uh, or made slight errors. So please let me know if you spot any so that I can improve. And then also this gets pretty technical. So bear with me and I'll try to explain everything. And then I'm not gonna do much editing on this video as a heads up, but yeah, let's start. For those who have Stephen McClure's class at Nomen for Intro to 3D with Maya, some of these things I will be uh, kind of quoting or repeating things that he has said, but a lot of it will not be that. So bear with me. Um, but the first thing is that uh, EXIF data is essentially um, data that is stored on a, fo a image file that contains some information about the kind of camera that took that photo. And so the point of this is that basically if you can find an image with EI EXIF data, that's going to be an ideal case scenario um, because it will really make our lives a lot easier. Um, so for example, I'll go into this uh, more later, but like this photograph, for example, uh, the main things that I have that are important is I can see the focal length and then I can see the name of the camera. And then the last thing is that I can see the exact lens of the camera. So those are the three most important things that we can see from the EXIF data. And so try and find photos that have that. Some good resources for places that have that EXIF data is pexels.com. If I look in like interior, um, most of these photos are going to have uh, EXIF data. If I hit more info here on pexels, this one actually does not have enough data. So I'm going to go find another one. Let's see this one. This is not like a great photo anyways, but yeah. So we have the camera name. We have the focal length. And here it's not displaying our actual lens, but let's see if we can free download that. And if we can open this up in Photoshop, let's see if it has the lens information because that would be ideal. So downloads, boom, and then file, file info. So we don't actually have lens info and then the camera info is not embedded on the camera. So that is actually still technically not ideal, but it is better than nothing. Another source that is generally going to have some camera data in the f images that we download is going to be called archello.com. And remember, so the important parts of the camera metadata is the camera name, the focal length, and then the lens name. So archello.com is going to have a lot of architectural stuff. So once this loads, we will be able to see that. There we go. So these are kind of like, it's kind of like an architectural project website. So at first glance, it may not be extremely um, useful, but you can see something like this actually could be an intro to Maya photo. So you can kind of look through something like a spotlight or just kind of their galleries or inspiration. Um, I'm gonna click on this one, for example. We just wanna make sure we don't find, sometimes there will be a project for an entire house and most of the images will be of the exterior of the house, but sometimes it'll be interior design like this one. So if we scroll down, we can click on our view gallery. And these are actually all pretty good images, assuming they're not too wide angle. Um, so really wide angle can have distortion and be hard to match, um, but it still can be undistorted. So we'll just go with something that kind of is in the middle. And let's see if this one has our uh, image data. So we'll hit download and then um, looks like we need to make an account but let's see if I can just save image as, and then we'll go like that. And then let's see if we have our info that we need. So if we go to file, and then if we go to file info, we have our focal length, we have our lens, and we have our camera. In this case, it's an iPhone, but we have all the things that we need. So yeah, our cello is a good re resource for finding photos. Um, not just photos with good data, but a lot of these are actually like pretty good photos too. Um, this is just one house area, but honestly, a lot of these photos could be used for a midterm reference. 
And then a third good source. This one is mostly just for like visually pleasing images and not necessarily um, ones that have camera specs, but they may have camera specs, is the Interior Design Reddit. Specifically, uh, this person, I don't know who they are, but Mania for Beatles on Reddit um, kind of owns this uh, subreddit in terms of posting really um, aesthetically pleasing um, images. And then also, yeah, see Mania for Beatles, Mania for Beatles. And if we click on it, um, if we scroll down, we should be able to find a comment from them. They always leave this with the more pics and information. And then on this website, we can find um, the full resolution images. And then we might be able to even, if we go and search this image with Google, we might even be able to find this image stored on another website like Arcello that would have the uh, camera data if we go and in, um, search for it. So if we hit, do that right click, search images with Google, and then we draw a box around it, it'll open this Google lens. And if we hit find image source, it'll open this. We can hit find other sizes of this image. So I'm gonna go large. And then let's see if any of these websites look like they might have that camera metadata. I mean, there's a chance that this one does, but it probably doesn't because it's from the design files. It's probably just like a web formatted image, but we'll test it anyways. So save that and then let's open it and see if it has that camera metadata. And then file, file info. And it doesn't, but it, you know, at least it is a aesthetically pleasing image. But yeah, so those are the three places that I look for photos for this. So you may be wondering why EXIF data is so important. Um, so I'll go over that now. And if you remember, the important EXIF data to have is the lens name, the camera name, and the lens focal length. So if we have our focal length comparison chart up here, I will kind of explain um, why that is all important. Um, so if we can see here, at a basic level, focal length is how zoomed in a lens is. So these photos were all taken from the same uh, camera position. And as the focal length increases, the uh, photo appears to be more zoomed in. Um, this is, however, not the same as if we were to just digitally infinitely zoom um, from this first image onto the subject matter of this last image. It would not appear the same. And this is because of another property of focal length, which I will show you with this image. So um, in this image, we can see that as the focal length increases, the photographer steps backwards and this is to account for that kind of zoom in effect, that way that the subject takes up the same relative spot in the frame. And we can see that the focal length change is actually also changing how our subject and background appear. So our subject, um, we kind of see they become more, their face becomes more flat as the focal length increases. And by the way, a lens with a large focal length is called a long lens. And then a lens with a shallow, or sorry, a small focal length is called a wide lens. And so we can see that the face gets flatter as it increases. And then in the background, we see less of it as it increases. Um, and so we might think that if we just have the focal length, we can perfectly match our image, but that is not true because of something to do with the sensor size, um, which we can obtain from knowing what our camera is. So if we know the name of our camera, which is our second important piece of metadata, what we can do next is we can use its uh, sensor size information. So if we go and look up our camera, which I'll do with a new tab. Um, in this case, I'm going to use an example with my camera um, that I shot some examples with, which is the Sony a6600. And we just type sensor size because in this hypothetical scenario, we got an image with the EXIF data that had the information of what our camera was. And from our sensor size, we can see that it is uh, 23.5 by 15.6 millimeters, which is the APS-C crop for a um, Sony camera. And so what is the sensor size? If I open up this image here, um, we can see what how it's important to us. Um, so here are two cameras and this box right here is the sensor. And as you can see, the APS-C, which is actually what our Sony um, one was that we just mentioned, um, is actually a lot smaller, um, but it is the same in proportion. So we can say that this is a full frame sensor and this is a cropped sensor, as if we cropped um, this sensor out of this sensor, we could kind of obtain the same result, which we'll see with this example here. Um, 
if this was taken with uh, two cameras but located at the same position, one after the other, and one was a full frame and one was an APS-C, and they had the exact same focal length lens, we could see that this full frame camera would capture this much of the image, but this cropped uh, smaller sensor size would only result in this much of the image. So even though they have the same focal length, so we can't just figure out the kind of um, relative focal length and zoom, I guess you could call it, from just the focal length, we also need to know the sensor size, which we can find if we know the name of our camera. Um, and so if we open up back up our focal length comparison chart, we can see um, kind of another way to explain that would be if we only have the information that our lens is 24 millimeters, and we're going to assume that this chart was shot with a full frame camera, this is what a 24 millimeter lens would look like with this full frame camera. But actually, if we shot this from the same camera position with a APS-C camera, the 20 and a 24 millimeter lens still, the image would actually end up looking kind of like this 35 millimeter lens because it's a smaller cropped sensor. So we need to keep that in mind. So those are the two important parts. And then our third important part is the name of the lens. Um, because of the properties of the glass in the, in the lens, um, they can kind of get distorted at the edges, uh, images taken with these lenses. So we'll get into that one later. But if we open up our distortion types, we can see our spherical distortion types, which can happen from the glass in the lens. So barrel distortion is when the image kind of tries to pop out at us, it appears. And pincushion distortion is when the distortion kind of looks like we're pushing into it, kind of like it's a piece of fabric and we're pushing towards it in this case and something is pushing towards us in this case. So we can see some examples of that distortion. Um, so this is a kind of an extreme version of that barrel distortion. We can see it kind of appears as though there is like a sphere or something bulging out at us from here. And we can especially see it on this edge with these curved buildings. So this has barrel distortion. And then this one right here has our, um, sorry, let me find that image, pincushion distortion. And this one actually has a grid that was uh, laid over it from uh, whatever website I got this from, but we can see how the lines of this building are distorted. So why is this important? Well, we'll talk about that next. And right before I talk about that, I just want to reiterate, um, you can kind of see the um, EXIF data from your photo if you go to open it in Photoshop and go to file file info and then on the camera data tab and once again the important part is the camera name which is the ICE LCE 6600 from Sony in this case and then the focal length which is the 35 millimeter focal length and then we also need the lens which is for the distortion part that we'll name um, because each lens can have different distortion so we need the specific make of the lens. So in this case, this photo was shot with the E35 millimeter F1.8 OSS. And if I Google that, we should be able to find it. E35 millimeter um, F1.8 OSS Sony. And then we'll just add our sensor just in case we can't find it. And in this case, we found this exact lens right here. So we now know from that metadata that this is the lens that shot that image. And then that means that we can actually replicate the distortion um, that this lens creates in kind of an inverse way, which means that we will actually be applying a profile or an, uh, whether manually or automatically created so that we can take an image that was taken with this lens and then we can undistort it, so to speak, so that the lines are no longer curved around the edges, whether with pincushion or barrel distortion. The reason that it is important to correct for this distortion so and to undistort our image is that um, in a CG space like Maya, the, our lines um, are not going to get distorted by our digital lens. They can get like kind of drawn out and stretched if we set our focal length to something a bit crazy, like 10, but actually the lines are going to stay uh, straight. And what our spherical distortion or optical distortion from a lens does is it actually curves these lines um, as they approach the edges of the image. Um, so yeah, this is gonna be easiest to undistort our image if we have that EXIF data, um, but we can kind of eyeball it if we don't have the EXIF data. But uh, first I will go over undistorting an image with EXIF data. 
And then right before we get into that, I'm gonna explain how I have my folders set up. So this faux Z is gonna be, treat this as your Z drive at Nomen. Um, I'm at home, so I don't have this actual Z drive, but just pretend that this faux Z is our Z drive at Nomen, um, and we're directly on it. And the exception to that is this downloads folder. This would just be, uh, this is pretending to be your downloads folder. I just kind of have everything packaged like this, so it's easy, um, easily laid out. And then our project file can be set up kind of arbitrarily. Um, we have our Maya workspace in here. So if I go to set project in Maya, um, and then we go to our project file, this folder is where I would set my project to. And that is why I have a source images here. And then I have a scenes and then an assets folder. You can kind of set up your project however you like, um, just as long as it's organized. Um, and then Depending on how we understore our image, we will have a, uh, a nuke file. We might, that is not required though, in some cases. And then um, in our assets folder, I like to structure it as a from folder structure. So we will be using fspy. So I have a from fspy folder, and then we will be using nuke for some of the scenarios. So I have a from nuke folder. Um, but yeah, so that is just how I have it set up. Um, scenes in here. Uh, source images here and then the nuke and then assets and then this is just our faux z drive is just our z drive so if i create something here or move something here it's just like doing that on your z drive all right so we're going to look at how to understore an image with exif data um, so here's a collection of files that i have uh, photographs uh, these ones were taken by me and these ones were from our cello and they have the EXIF data embedded in their file. Um, so I'm gonna start with uh, these ones. So this photograph, I have all of the EXIF data embedded in it. So if I open it in Photoshop and go to file info, I can see the camera uh, name, the lens name, and then the focal length, uh, the, the three key parts, as we've mentioned. Um, I also did just know that anyways, because I was the one who took the camera with my equipment. So I knew what I shot it with, but Let's just say in this scenario, we'll pretend that I got it online. Um, so the first method to remove distortion um, from an EXIF image is we're gonna see if Photoshop has a lens profile for it. And so what a lens profile is, it is allows us to use our info from our file info, which I'm actually gonna screenshot so that we can see it when we move over to the next tool in Photoshop. So I now have this off to the side here so I can refer back to it. Um, but yeah, with if we go to our filter and then lens correction, uh, with this lens correction tool, we can see if Adobe has a lens profile for this lens. And if it does, what that means is it can actually find um, the type of lens and they have these files that have data about the lens that will properly undistort it. So we're gonna go in, into our camera make, which is a Sony. And then our camera model, this menu can be a little bit finicky. Um, for example, we have a Sony in all caps and a Sony regular for this specific lens. So maybe not for all Sony lenses, um, but for this specific lens, the one that I found that has the correct lens profile is the Sony in all caps. And then now in this lens profile dropdown, all of these are the lens profiles that I can apply to this image to undistort it. Um, but only the one that is specifically for our lens will correctly undistort it. So we can filter that further instead of scrolling through it by using this lens model. And if we look back at our screenshot, we can see that our specific lens is the E24 millimeter uh, f-stop 2.8, and then with this code F051 at the end. So let's see if we can filter and find that one. And indeed we have the E24 millimeter f2.8 F051, and that has now filtered all of the different lens profiles to this one. So now if we click on this one and hit OK, it's actually going to undistort our image. So if I undo and redo, you can actually see how these distorted curved lines get straightened. And so now this image uh, in particular with EXIF data using the Photoshop lens profile, we are now able to actually have these uh, kind of linear lines that will be better for camera matching in 3D. And the next example will be what to do if our lens profile in Photoshop uh, does not exist for our specific lens. 
Okay, so in an ideal scenario, we're gonna have an image with EXIF data, and we're gonna have an available uh, lens correction preset from Adobe in Photoshop. Um, so, or lens correction profile, I should say. So all of these photos that were taken with my uh, Sony a6600 with these corresponding Sigma, uh, Tamron, and Sony lenses, we do have those lens correction profiles available. However, um, this image that I found from our cello has a lens that is not um, an available lens correction profile. So if I go to file, uh, file info, we can see it was taken with this TSE 24 millimeter uh, Canon lens uh, with this Canon camera. So although the lens correction profile does have some Canon uh, lenses for the Canon EOS 5D Mark IV, we don't actually have this specific lens. Um, from the research that I did, it's because, um, so a lens correction profile doesn't just uh, account for distortion, it also accounts for um, any darkening or lightening that a lens may do on its edges. Um, and so a TS lens um, is a tilt shift lens where a kind of um, central viewpoint can be rotated so it's not parallel with the image uh, from the sensor. So supposedly the reason uh, that they don't have these tilt shift lens uh, profiles is because they would have to make one for every possible degree of tilt um, because of that um, color correction uh, for that lightning and darkening that I mentioned. But from my understanding, the uh, optical distortion will be the same no matter what. Um, I may be incorrect in that, but either way, some lenses we will not have a Photoshop lens profile for. So what do we do in that case? We will go to this website um, called uh, LensFun, which is actually a um, kind of whole uh, database of lens profiles that are just in a different format. So we're going to check on this lens list for our specific lens. So if you remember, it's the um, TSE24 um, from the Canon. So I'm going to just search for TS and then look at that E24 millimeter. And so it is actually going to be right here with our Canon lenses here. And so we can also see that there are two of them. And if we don't know what one to use, we can see, if we scroll up here, we'll see what the crop is. And I'll actually go into that later um, and explain how that works. But for now, we know that we are able to use these lens profiles um, from this website for this specific lens, um, where that lens profile was not available in Photoshop. So how we actually undistort using these profiles is a little bit complicated. So bear with me, uh, and I'll try to explain everything um, as we go on. Okay, so we now know that that lens profile is available on the lens fun database. So we want to actually use that. And so the way we're going to use that is with uh, Python. Um, and if you've never used Python coding before, do not worry. I will try to explain um, everything in a step by step way where you don't necessarily need to understand exactly how what we're doing is working, but kind of just what we are doing. Um, so what we want to do is we want to download Python. So Python may already already be installed on your computer, but we kind of want to create our own um, environment uh, of Python, which is to say our own kind of um, separate embedded area where we can know what exactly is installed for our Python that we're running. Um, and if none of this is making sense, don't worry, I'll explain it step by step. Um, but anyways, what we're going to do is we're going to go to our latest release and we're going to go and find one called the Windows Embeddable Package which should be a 64-bit zip file. So once you've downloaded that, um, if we go over to here, I'm gonna go to my Z drive, or my fake Z drive, um, right here. And so this is my downloads folder. So that will download this Python, and then the version, uh, for me it's 3.11.1, and then this embed stuff. And if we're gonna, we're gonna go and hit right click, and then we're gonna hit extract all, and you're gonna hit extract and it will create a folder um, like this one right here. And that will have all of this inside. So if we go back, I'm gonna go and take this from my downloads folder and with a uh, control C, um, you can also just move it depending on what you wanna do. Um, but uh, your downloads folder may be anywhere, but mine is in this fake Z drive. 
but where we want to put it is on your actual Z drive. So for me, this is my fake Z drive, but put this on your actual Z drive. So there will just be this Python folder here. All right. All right, once we have our uh, Python um, kind of version install and localized in this Z drive here, what we want to do is we're going to go to this next link that will be in the description and we're going to go right click, save as, and then we're going to go to our Z drive again. In my case, it's faux Z drive. And we're going to go into our Python folder and we're going to save it as is just directly in that Py folder or Python folder, sorry. And now if we go back to our file explorer, we're gonna be in our Z drive, open our Python local folder. And then now we will see that folder that we just put in, get pip.py is there. So if we click up here in this uh, kind of address bar and type the word uh, letters C and D, uh, short for command and hit enter, it'll open this box. So all we have to do now is we have to type in the word python.exe. So what this is going to do is it's going to run this uh, python.exe, but we want to do it on our own terms. So what we want to do is we're going to add a hyphen m, and then um, we are going to, sorry, delete that hyphen m. So python.exe space, and then what we want to do is do a period slash, and then we're going to type the name git uh, hyphen pip.py exactly as it is in our file explorer. And if we hit enter, uh, what is that is going to do is it's going to install pip. So if we see this flashing thing here without this line with our drive here, it is not done. But now that we see our drive and this flashing thing here, it is now done. And so we can check that it's done in our scripts folder. We'll see this pip stuff. All right. And then now um, we want to make sure that we're still running in the context of this folder. So it should be blah, blah, blah. In your case, it should just say Z and then the Python folder. Um, and then we're gonna type python.exe again. And then we're gonna do dash m or hyphen m and then the word install and then another space. And then we're gonna type the word numpy. So n-u-m-p-y and hit enter. And I typed that wrong, so sorry, but luckily that didn't do anything. So python.exe dash m and then we're gonna write the words pip, p-i-p space install numpy sorry about that hold up why did that not work bro i am bugging run it back all right so um now we have our kind of local python install in this folder here so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go to this link in the description and we're going to right click and hit save as and then down here it should say git uh, hyphen pip dot py and if we go to our Z drive and our Python local folder, we're just gonna save it directly in there. So now if we go to our Python local folder, we should see that file, the git pip.py. And then the next thing we're gonna do is we're going to uh, click on this address bar and type the word CMD, uh, which is short for command. And then now we're running this command prompt from this folder, which you can see. Uh, for you guys, it should just say Z and then this Python folder. So if we type python.exe, um, we're able to find that python.exe because it's in this folder. So this is our folder, and then this is our python.exe, so this will work. And then what we're gonna do is we want to run this git pip.py. So we're gonna do a period slash git hyphen pip.py. And then what, what this will do is it will load for a second and it will not be done until we can see our blinking address bar next to our Z and then Python folder again. And it says successfully installed pip. So we're gonna close that temporarily. We're gonna scroll down and find this Python 311 underscore, or sorry, dot underscore PTH. We're gonna, now we're gonna go over and on the Nomen computers, you should have a program called Sublime Text installed. Um, and if you don't, you can install that. Um, it should not be too difficult. Um, but we're gonna go and drag this PTH file in here. And we're gonna delete this hashtag at the beginning. And we're gonna hit save. All right, and then now if we go into here and we type the word CMD again, we're now running in here again and we can write our python.exe. And then now we can type um, hyphen m and then the word pip 
and then hyphen hyphen and then the word version. And now we can see our pip version, which means everything is working correctly. So still running in the context of this folder, um, if it ever messes up and it says something else, um, like if I type python.exe and hit enter, it will now just be three um, greater than signs instead of our entire folder. Uh, we're just gonna hit X and go to the address bar and hit CMD again. But anyways, now um, once we're running in this address bar, we're gonna write python.exe and then hyphen M and then we're gonna go write the word pip and then the word install and then the word numpy. So N-U-M-P-Y, so short for number and short for Python. This will also install and it won't be done until we see that path bar again and it will say successfully installed and ignore these warnings here. And then we're gonna write python.exe hyphen M pip install and then now we're gonna type in the word open and then the letters CV no spaces and then the uh, character hyphen and then we're going to type the word python so opencv python hit enter that will install opencv and then after that we're going to run one more install so python.exe it's hyphen m pip install and then we're going to run or we're, not, we're going to install the library lens fun pi which uses allows us to use this LensFun database in Python, which is the entire reason we're doing this actually. So um, that will say successfully installed, and now we can go ahead and close this. So now our Python uh, kind of environment is all ready to go. Um, so now we're gonna open up Sublime Text again, and we're going to uh, close out of this underscore PTH file because we don't wanna edit that anymore. And then now we're gonna make a new file, so um, control N and then we're going to file save as file save as so we can set the location go to our Z drive and then I'm gonna put this in my project file in my source images file uh, folder because this is gonna be our Python script that will uh, run the lens correction that will undistort our images uh, when this Python is run so I'm gonna just call this um, undistort and then make sure you add .py so that it's a Python file. And then the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go to tools, build system, and then new build system. And then there will be this code inside here. And then in the description, I will include some code to paste in. It's gonna be right here. And then this path here, we're gonna delete that and then replace it with our own path. So this own path that we wanna find is we're gonna to go to back to our Z drive in our Python folder. And then we're just gonna copy that and then paste it in between here. And so the first thing, we wanna make sure that it is in between quotes and we wanna make sure that we replace all of these, um, what are these, back or forward slashes? Don't really know, I think those are backslashes and we'll replace them with forward slashes. And then at the end here, we're gonna do another slash and we're just gonna write the word Python. And then we're gonna hit Control S. Oh, sorry, added an extra character at the end, so delete that, Control S. And this should open your um, uh, roaming folder, which will be probably on your Z drive, and then sublime text, and then packages, and then user. And then your folder will probably be empty. Um, and so ignore what I just deleted, that was an earlier test. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna call this Python, and then type the version uh, so we're on Python 3.1.1, and then we're going to call this our underscore Z uh, because this is our Python installation on our Z drive. And then for me, this is my fake Z drive, so I'm going to add the word foe. And then we're going to do a dot and then the word sublime hyphen build, just like that. So I'm going to hit save. And then now if I close out of this, in this um, undistort.py, which is currently empty, I can go to tools and I can go to build system. And then now I can select my Python 311 underscore Z. And then now there will be another uh, larger chunk of code in the description um, that I can paste into here. And so we're gonna just save this for now and not do anything with it quite yet um, because the next thing we need to do is find our actual lens profile. All right, so when we installed our uh, lens fun um, database, uh, where it went is on our Z drive, in our Python folder, in our lib folder, in our site packages folder, 
and then in our lens fun pie folder and not this one just this one then our database underscore finals db underscore files it's in here and then now we have all of these dot um, xml files and we can kind of see what they are by reading the name here so um, going back to our example here where we have our Canon camera and we need to find this tilt shift lens so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go um, back away from Photoshop for a second so I'm gonna hit minimize so we have these kind of um, prefixes that are either compact and then mil and then we have SLR um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look in our corresponding SLR and mil XML files um, and what we wanted to look for is our camera make um, so I'm actually going to go into Photoshop here one more time file uh, file info and then I'm going to screenshot my camera make and lens make and then or model as well bring that over here so that we can keep track of it alright and then in our sublime text we're gonna go over here and we're gonna drag in our first one that we're gonna check so the first one we're gonna check is our SLR Canon and the reason we're picking this one is because the make is Canon so SLR Canon and now we just see there's a lot of code in here and that's gonna be just hard to look through so what we're going to do is we're going to get control F and then we're going to look for a keyword um, that has to do with our um, camera. So in my case, I'm going to look up the word, um, I'm going to try the word 5D and we can see, uh, look at this, Canon EOS 5D and then 5DS. So this is not the exact model we want. So let's see if we can narrow it down further. Let's write the word mark. And then um, you can see it's right here actually, Mark 4. But there's also Mark 3 and 2, and probably 1. I guess it's just called the EOS 5D. Um, but let's just make sure we completely narrow our search down and add 5D Mark 4. So now we have this important information, which is our camera maker and our camera model. So in this tab up here, our undistort, let's copy our camera maker. And then we're going to scroll down in this long file and then you should see right here these lines that are to the far left and so our camera maker put it in between these two um, ticks here control v canon and then our camera model is this exact part and make sure we get this exactly and then paste it in between here all right so now we have our cam maker and cam model so now what we need is our lens and then our, len our lens information, which will be our maker and model. So what we're gonna do over here is go and find the um, lens maker and lens uh, model. So we know from here uh, what our lens is. So it's a TSE24 F.35L2. So let's just Google that, TSE24. Um, F352 and it's right here and we can see the brand that makes this lens so in our case it's actually the same manufacturer for the camera and the lens because this is a Canon TSE 24 millimeter 3.5 so back in sublime text um, we are in the Canon folder still and this is because we're gonna still check this one because our camera was here Canon and because our lens is a Canon lens. So let's see if we can find it. So let's type right, control F, and then down here, TSE. And can't find anything. Let's go to our lens fund date website and see if it's spelled differently. So there might be a hyphen actually. So TS hyphen E. And actually, yeah, look at that. So it is in our uh, Canon XML uh, for the SLR. And so let's say on the off chance it wasn't in there, um, we would check also our uh, MIL Canon. So it could be in here, depending on the type of camera and lens that you're shooting with. In our case, it's not in this one though, but we could do the same process. But all we're really looking for here is this, um, it will be a lens maker and model. And then the other one will say camera right here and then maker and model. And we already copied the camera one. So we're gonna now take the lens maker. So the lens maker is just Canon. And then our lens model is this 
exact thing in between these two uh, greater than and less than signs. And make sure we also put it in between these um, dashes. All right. And now what we're going to do is we're going to input our focal length. So if we go back to Photoshop and we go to File and then File Info, focal length is 24. So we can go back and to our this guy and then make it 24.0. All right, and then after setting our focal length, we want to set our aperture. So right here we have, um, we can see it's f-stop 16. Um, so this is just going to be 16. And then we'll do a 0, 0.0 just in case. And then so our distance is actually going to be our um, distance in meters. Um, um, to focal point. Um, yeah, so if we go to our image, we can see um, one of these points is going to be more in focus than the other, or I guess a plane that is comes from the camera is going to be more in focus. Um, since our image is pretty much just in focus regardless, um, this number is going to be pretty much, I guess, just like our center of attention. So I guess we could just say like, oh, how far away from the camera do we think like the tip of this table is? And then it's going to be in meters. Um, so I don't know. I don't have a great sense of meters. I will say like five. So I'm going to go 5.0. All right. And so now um, what we are going to do is we're going to test the database loading. So this function is going to use all of our, the things we just set up except for these ones. So I guess it's going to use these ones that we just set up. And if we press control B, it will print out these two lines. And we'll just be able to see that it worked um, by seeing that we have our camera name, uh, the camera info and like the lens name, lens info, stuff like that. All right. So um, now that we know that it works, we can add a hashtag here to make it uh, this command no longer run or this function, I guess, and then delete this hashtag. So now this one will run. Um, and then the last part that we need to set is this image path. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my back to this. I'm going to go back to my Z drive. I'm going to go to my project fo uh, folder. In my project folder, I have my source images. And then so here's my undistort. And then, so let's just, I'm gonna bring in my um, original image, which I'll bring in from a new spot here. So what I, yeah, what I wanna do is I wanna bring in this uh, printer's row image. And for you, you would bring in whatever image you're working with. So for me, I have that stored over in my photos, printer's row. All right, so now I have printer's row in my source images. And so what I can do is I can shift and right click and then there's a copy as path button. So now I'm going to go ahead here and I'm going to delete those two quotation marks because when I copied as path, uh, they're going to add quotation marks when I paste it in. So I have control V. And then once again, I'm going to switch these slashes so that they're the other one. Um, and on my keyboard, at least these ones are to the left of the right shift button um, on, instead of being the ones that are under the backspace key. So this is the path that it's going to look at the original image. And then now we need to set a path for where it will put the new image. So I'm just going to copy this. I'm going to paste it in. And so right now this would just overwrite our old image, but I want to keep the old one. So I'm going to add a underscore undistorted. So now when this runs, what it will do, um, and also if that ever, if that purchase thing ever pops up for sublime text, you can just hit cancel. Um, just okay to use it for free. Um, but yeah, so now when I run this code, this undistort function, which is no longer commented out with that hashtag, so this will do nothing, this will run it. Um, that undistort function will run and it will create this image. So if I hit control B to run, I just give it a second. And then now I'm gonna open the original one first. And now I'm gonna open the undistorted one. And you can see these line, like these, especially here, we can see that this original one, if we look a little bit close, it appears as though there is uh, th there is for sure spher spherical distortion, and it appears as though someone kind of has like something pushing out towards us, and then now it kind of gets flattened out and undistorted um, because of what we did using that 
um, lens profile from LensFun, the database. And so it did take some Python and some technical stuff to figure, figure it out. But now what we can do is that using this code and then just making sure we set our correct paths, um, we can take any image as long as we set the correct path in here. Um, and then we're making sure that we are running with our build system that is running from our Python version that has lens, uh, the lens fun and NumPy and OpenCV installed. Um, which we did with the command line um, where we were typing pip install and then whatever one of that was. Um, so and now as long as we open those XML files, which once again, those XML files are gonna be in our Z drive, in our Python folder, in our lib folder, in our site packages, and then they're gonna be in our lens fun pie and then database files. So if we open these XML files um, according to which lens we have, and which camera we have, we can get our camera maker and our camera model and our lens maker and our lens model. And then we can go ahead and from our EXIF, we can input our focal length, which is another one of our key EXIFs. And then one of the ones that is not one that I mentioned as key is the aperture. So in case your photo does not have this aperture and the EXIF data, kind of just look at your photo and see if it's all, if it's like a larger space like this is, um, as opposed to a close-up of a face or something like that, and it's all in focus, which it is, um, or at least the stuff that is out of focus, it does not appear to be so blurry. That is because the aperture is relatively high. Um, so if your image looks like this and everything is kind of just in focus, um, we can assume that our aperture is going to be relatively high, so something like uh, probably like 10 plus um, f-stop if all in focus. Um, um, and so that would be, we would use that in the case um, of if we go to file and then file info, we would use that um, estimation if we didn't have this exposure EXIF where it tells us our F slash and then that 16. But in this case, we do have it, so we put that 16 there. Um, and then just a coding thing, um, it is sometimes a good idea to add a 0 0.0 afterwards, because 16 and 16.0 are the same, but in some cases it would not work if we just had 16. It probably would have worked in this case, but we're just doing it just to be safe. So one scenario that might come up is if you have a lens um, and you, when you're searching for it in this lens fund database, um, let's see, let's go with the Tamron, um, and then the Tamron E24 f2.8. You might come up with a scenario where you have a lens that's in this database on this website, but if you go to your database files um, in your Python folder, you'll open up your Sublime and then drag in your um, first, let's check in the MIL, and then we're going to search for this name. So we're going to search for E24 millimeter. We're going to go ahead and see that there is no result in here. So it's not an MIL, so let's try SLR Tamron. And we're using Tamron because that is the uh, maker. So control F and then just to reset it kind of. And it's not in either of those. So what happened um, is when we installed this database with Python, that Python version is actually a little bit out of date just based on the person who developed the Python version. Um, so this database on this website is more up to date. Um, so we don't actually have access to um, some of these lenses, but what we can do is we can click this V project on GitHub button and then if we go to data and then database This is the most up-to-date version of the database. So let's go ahead and find first our MLI Tamron Let's see if it's in this ML MIL one So it's what is the lens called? Let's see um, I'm gonna right click up here and then middle mouse click back on this website to open up the lens fund website without getting rid of this one. And I'm gonna go back to Tamron and the one we're looking for is E24 millimeter F2.8. So let's go ahead and search that with control F. And turns out we did get lucky and it is actually gonna be in this MIL Tamron. Um, but it is not in our MIL Tamron. So let's open up our, um, sorry, don't wanna do it from there. Let's go in here to our installed version and let's open up our MIL, MIL time run and let's drag it in here and so what we noticed is that um, this 
this lens and so everything if you see here to here these are on the same line so it's kind of surrounded by this word lens so this one has lens here and this one has a slash lens everything in between here describes this tamron lens if we go ahead and copy that we can now go to our uh, installed version and if i hit uh, enter let's make sure that we're on the same line as this lens because all of the lenses should be one tab indent um, after this original lens database and if i paste that in i now have essentially added this uh, lens so if i control save this with file save or control s um, we have now saved and added this lens to our database so now if we go back in here let's try an example with that image so first let's find our camera so um, if we go to our photoshop and then let's open an image that was taken with that lens and camera file info the camera is the sony ilce 6600 so let's see in our database um, and then it's going to be in sony it could either be an mil or slr but first we'll check mil and then control f for ilce and so it looks like we actually have found it, um, but these are the wrong versions. So let's finish the whole descriptive name, which is gonna be ILCE-6600. All right, so now we have our Maker Sony model ILCE-6600. So our, and that is our camera. So our camera model is that ILCE, and then the maker is the Sony. And now our lens is gonna be what we got from that database. So, uh, or from the database um, updated from online. So Tamron is the maker of the lens. And then the uh, lens model that we downloaded and added to our XML file is the E24 millimeter. So I'm gonna paste that in here. And then let's see, um, it looks like we do actually have that exposure information. So f-stop or the aperture is 2.8. So aperture, 2.8 and focal length is still 24 and then distance let's see what is the most in focus here for the focal distance looks like just the closest part is actually in focus um, so I'm gonna say something like three meters um, is what is the sharpest uh, three meters away from the lens um, and that would be uh, on the plane so let's say if I have a uh, Let's say that this is a three-dimensional plane that its, uh, its feet or its bottom is on this part of the carpet. Um, that is the distance we're talking to. We're talking to the center of this plane, or at least the center uh, or the part that the camera is pointing directly at. We're not talking about a line that is drawn from the camera to the point on the ground. We're talking about um, kind of like a straight distance, but it is just an estimate at the end of the day. So I'm going to go ahead and say three meters. And so aperture 2.8, uh, yep, looks like that's all good. So before we undistort it, let's turn that off with a comment and then uncomment this one just to test the database. Control B, and looks like it all is in order. So we're gonna turn that off and before we run this again now, we're gonna make sure we have the correct image path. So this is still using our old image. So we're gonna go ahead and go to our source images and then I'm gonna bring in the correct image so I'm going to copy the name of this image. And so you'll see I have this, if I hit rename, you, I can see the file extension and I can also just see it here. If you can't see that, um, click on this arrow in the corner of your file explorer to open it up, go to view and hit file name extensions. And then you can hide that again if you want to, or just keep it open. Um, and then right click rename and then control A to get everything, control C to copy. And then now we don't have printers row.jpg, we have this uh, file.jpg and then same thing for the undistorted version that's going to be created we're going to paste that in and we don't want to overwrite the same file because right now these are the same file um, we want a new version of the file that is undistorted so this will create a new one that has the underscore undistorted in the name and then if I press control B to run this and then go in here we now have an undistorted version so look at that, boom, 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 boom. All right, and so now if I go to um, here, we can actually see, um, these are some examples I did before. So this is the original, 
Um, and I'm just doing it this way so that we can see um, it's compared. So this is original photo with distortion. This was our Adobe correction, and you can see it also changed that color, because uh, as I described earlier, a lens correction profile can also change color. In our um, case with Python, we're not doing that, but with Adobe, we are. So, but we do see our main uh, goal, though, is that these distortion is removed and the lines are straight. And then I'm gonna go from this one to the uh, Python version, and you'll see it is a little bit different, uh, but in general, the lines are less distorted, which is the goal. All right, so that is the second method if we have EXIF data. Um, and we're gonna use that Python library for the lens fun database. Um, only in the scenario if uh, we have EXIF data and our lens profile is not supported with Adobe. Because that is kind of like, as you saw, a complicated way of doing things, but um, it is gonna be necessary if Adobe does not have our correct lens profile. All right, so those were the first two ways to undistort an image if we have EXIF data. Let's go to the third way now. So this is our third way. I went from this is our second way to our third way. You can see how they're a little bit different. Our third method is going to use Nuke and it is going to be our most niche uh, method and rarely used method. That is because we are only going to be using this method if we were the ones who shot our own um, photograph because we need access to the physical lens and camera. Um, and the reason for this is because we're going to shoot something called a distortion grid. So if I close out of our lens database, because we're now done with that, and also I'm gonna close out of our sublime text because we're done with that for now, um, I can now go back to our um, source images. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to shoot a distortion grid. So if I open up this PDF, you'll see uh, this grid of just boxes and check marks. Uh, sorry, not check marks, just a checker grid. Um, and so what this distortion grid allows us to do is if we photograph a photo of this distortion grid with our lens, which you can do with a elaborate setup, um, and Hugo's Desk is a YouTube channel that has a good uh, setup for this to be completely proper. Um, but what I did is I went ahead and I just put this on my screen on my uh, desktop monitor, and then I just used my lens and shot a photo of it um, off of my screen. So again, this method requires you to have access to the camera and lens that shot the original photograph. But anyways, what I did is this is the um, final result. This is our distortion grid, and as you can see, the distortion of the lens has created this curvature. And so what we can do is we can use the software Nuke um, which is installed on the GNOME computers um, and make sure we're running Nuke X. So I'm gonna open Nuke X here. Um, Nuke X has, oops, sorry, I'm gonna close out of that. That was the wrong one, I guess, um, just for my account. I'll just do normal Nuke X, not Nuke X non-commercial. So we're gonna open Nuke X and we're gonna need uh, a few things. We're gonna need a f uh, photograph um, and we need to make sure that this photo um, was shot with the same camera and lens that our distortion grid was. So these two were shot with the same camera and lens. So we have access to both of them. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a read node in Nuke, and then it's gonna prompt us with where we wanna get it from. So I'm gonna go here to my Z drive and then my project file. Um, and remember your project file may be in a different directory or path. And so I'm gonna go into my source images and then we're gonna find wherever our um, original uh, distorted image is. So in this case, it'll be this one. And remember, make sure that our lens is, that shot this photograph is the same that shot our plate. So I'm gonna hit open here. And now this creates a read node and we can't actually see it, but if we drag this line to our viewer, we can now see it in here. And then now, remember, we now need our distortion grid. So I'm gonna hit a read image. And then if I go, now we're gonna go to where we have our uh, photograph stored of our distortion grid. So in my case, um, I actually have it in a little bit of a different path, um, which is this one. Um, and we can't see this one either, but if we draw this to the viewer, it will add a new. So we have a one and a two on this viewer. And to switch, we can go from read one to read two and we can see our distortion grid. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're going to 
um, undistort this and we're going to use the node lens distortion and sorry I didn't explain the way I'm adding these nodes is with the tab key so what nuke x has the ability to do is if we click on this node and click on analysis we can hit grid detect and then hit detect and then you'll see actually we have these orange lines that kind of go across the grid and so what we want to do is be on the lookout for any of these lines that do not line up and I saw some down here this line got confused by this text on this grid uh, for this particular distortion grid I picked. So over here, we can click on this um, thing here to select that line and then hit the delete key. And then that way that will mess us up. And then other than that, what we can do is uh, for exact precision, we could use this icon with the red dot and the line to draw our own line. So if I click and click, um, that will draw a line and we will just uh, draw lo those lines and make sure that they are three points long at least so one two three and then I could click on another an existing point to connect it and then hit enter or I could create a separate new one enter and just make sure you draw those lines so that they connect um, or line up with that distortion grid but I actually am not going to use any new ones so I'm going to undo that I'm just going to use the ones that we got from the uh, original detection and I'm going to hit the, word, uh, the command solve and then now you can see that's actually pretty undistorted here um, and so now um, this node now stores uh, what we did to undistort this image and since this was shot with the same lens we can copy and paste with control C control V that same lens distortion and then I'm going to go ahead to my viewer and set it back to this and then um, if I go ahead and hold and click and let go over this node connection, we will now see that we have um, this lens distortion is being applied to this um, image as well. And so if I hold, click and drag, I can shake it off and that will turn it off. And if I control Z, it will un undo my shake off and we can see it is distorting or correcting that distortion a little bit. Um, so the use case for this technique is going to be if we do not have a profile for our lens um, in Adobe or in that lens fun kit because this is going to be the most manual um, work um, or it's not necessarily I guess the lens fun is a lot of the manual work but this is going to be kind of the least accurate um, and you do require a manual shoot of that distortion grid with your exact camera and lens so you have to be the one taking the image um, but the one advantage it has over the other two is that it can be done with video so our lens corrections with the um, Photoshop and with our Python um, can only be done on images and although we could do image sequences of a video um, it's generally not going to be great but this lens distortion and nuke we can actually add to a video but regardless, um, now that we have this undistorted version, we can go ahead and hit tab and add a right node. And what this will do is it will save our image. So we're gonna drag this right arrow to this undistort because we want to take what is in this and then save it. And then on this file, I'm gonna hit this little file button or folder button. I'm gonna go to my Z drive, my project file, and then I'm gonna go to, um, we'll say assets and then from nuke. You can have your folder structure however you would like. Um, this is actually an image, so I wouldn't actually have it in my assets normally, but just for the sake of example. Um, and then, so this is just the folder structure, so we have to tell what file it should go to. So we will call this um, undistorted nuke. And then right now it's not a, f a file of any type, so we have to add a dot, and we'll say it's a dot JPEG, dot JPG. And we'll do a PNG actually, PNG, save. And then now it will automatically detect that file type and everything is kind of just set up how we'd like it already. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna hit the button render. And then I'm gonna hit the button okay. And then once this is done calculating, I'm gonna go to my um, folder and then go to my project file, assets from nuke, and then you can see undistorted nuke. And then I'll go back to that um, comparison folder that I had earlier. So once again, this is our comparison of the techniques. This is the original image. This is undistorted with the Photoshop lens profile. This is distor undistorted with the um, lens fun database lens profile. And this is the version that was um, undistorted with Nuke. 
And you'll see the Nuke version had to crop in a little bit more if we compare these than the other two. And that's because these lens profiles are using actual camera data um, as opposed to kind of a shot grid and uh, kind of like a algorithmic uh, approximation using Nuke. But still, they have their advantages and disadvantages and certain use cases. Um, so that is how you undistort an image if you're going to be having your camera EXIF data in three methods. And then next we'll go over how to do it um, just by eyeballing it if we do not have our EXIF data. All right, so let's say we're in a scenario where we don't have EXIF data. Um, in reality, this photo does have EXIF data, but we'll just treat it like it does not. Um, this will not be as um, precise as if we do have EXIF data, but what we can do is go to filter and then click lens correction. And so we don't actually have a lens profile, so we're not gonna use um, any of these. What we're gonna do is hit custom instead of auto correction. And so what we can kind of do is just, first of all, just try this distortion. So it looks like that was the correct direction, but we pushed it too far. So let's just essentially just eyeball and just see if we can get this looking decent. Um, and let's see, what do these tools up here do? All right, so it looks like we're gonna want a positive remove distortion value and let's try two and let's try three, four, five. All right, and so what we can kind of do is at least for vertical lines, if we have vertical lines is use our um, snipping tool um, and just you can use this to kind of measure and see if we are getting those lines correct. Um, so it's a bit too distorted still, um, but in the direction that we were pushing it. So we pushed it too far, so let's try four. Too far, three, and oh, let's undo that, hold up. Sorry about that. Um, control zero to reset view. Oh, control zero, there we go, sorry about that. All right, Um. right, let's see, two. not quite straight let's go three no nope. all right let's go let's go five again actually that might be there we go okay so that is pretty much straight um, we can see that it, these lines are actually rotated a little bit to our um, what is that direction that is the clockwise direction um, but they are still parallel so the goal of distortion is to remove is to make lines parallel um, if our perspective allows for parallel lines, which we'll talk about later, but this is a two point perspective image. So our up lines will be parallel. So we were able to just eyeball that um, using our lens corrections in Photoshop in manual mode. And these lines, um, although they are not straight up and down, they are pretty much parallel, um, which means our distortion is kind of corrected, uh, just eyeballed. So that is our Photoshop approximation. And now we'll do an approximation in Nuke. So let's um, open up Nuke X and I'll make a new um, folder or new file, project file, sorry. And then I'll close this old one. All right, so here's our new one. So let's bring in with a read, let's bring in our um, image. So Z drive, project file, source images, and we want to bring in the distorted and then we are using a two point our two point image that we shot and open drag that arrow down and now we can see it and we're going to use the lens distortion node and again i'm using tab to search for these nodes in nuke um, and so lens distortion node and then we're gonna go ahead and go to analysis. And so we don't have a grid to detect, so we're not gonna use this, but we are gonna use this um, red dot line drawn tool. So what we can do with this is we can add lines that have points, um, at least three points with makes one line. So I'm just gonna go and draw along this curve. So, and then I'm gonna hit enter to finish that curve. And then let's see, um, that's our first one. Let's see what other distorted lines we have. This one might not be 
as distorted in this direction, but we will add it anyways. Enter. And then same here. And like right there. Enter. And let's go ahead and see. Um, we'll add a vertical one here. Boom. 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 So ideally, you want these to be kind of evenly spaced. Um, so you'll see they're kind of stuck to my left side of this image, but I actually in this image just don't have um, enough details to add these lines to. I don't really have curves to add these lines to, except I guess on this one. Um, so I can't as easily use that right side of the image. So because uh, my lines are kind of unevenly placed, this um, undistort might end up not working great for this image, but it may work for other images depending on your scenario. But let's try and hit solve and see if we get any good result from that. Um, so when we hit solve, looks like these green ones are ones that worked. This yellow one it's not liking, so I'm actually just gonna go and click on this move tool with this curve arrow. And I'm gonna just select, a drag over one of these points and hit the delete key because it wasn't really being that helpful. And I'll hit solve again. And so now these green ones, it was able to um, undistort these. So now we can see that these lines are kind of straight. Um, and again, it is rotated again, but that is fine. It is still gonna be two point perspective and most of the distortion is removed. And once that is done, what we can do is we can add a right node to export this new undistorted image. Let's drag that to lens distortion with this arrow. And then we're gonna go to this file, hit this folder, uh, find the, the place we want to have it in. I'll put it in my project file, assets from nuke. And we'll say um, undistorted nuke underscore v2. So that uh, that first one was from um, when we were undistorting using nuke with EXIF data and a distortion grid. This one is just without any of that. This is just an approximation. Um, so we're going to hit save. And uh, first of all, hold up, make sure that we have our fire exten file extension .png or .jpg here and it will automatically detect which one we use. And then if we just hit the render button and hit OK, it will render that. And now if we open our um, location where we save that, which is gonna be in Z, and then we're gonna go into our download, or sorry, project file, assets from nuke. We now have our undistorted nuke version. And you can see that that is definitely gonna be lacking some of that distortion even though it's not as accurate as if we had the EXIF data, it has actually did a pretty decent job uh, getting rid of our distortion. All right, one thing before we move on to the next subject is um, another type of distortion. So this is our original image with optic distortion. Um, so in this case, it is uh, barrel distortion. And so what we did with our techniques, uh, in this case, I used the Adobe lens profile technique uh, we remove that optic distortion. Now another type of distortion that it has is perspective distortion, uh, but that is just what happens in a 3D world. These the lines get distorted as they are in perspective, but that's distorted in a natural three-dimensional way. But another type of distortion that may be present in a photograph that you download from online is gonna be kind of like a photo manipulation distortion. So I'll show you an example of how uh, a photographer might end up uh, producing an image with this kind of distortion so you understand what it is. So if a, pho if a photographer is um, editing their photos, they might use something like Lightroom or Photoshop, which has like these geometry um, uh, editing tabs. So if I hit this auto button, you'll see that some rotation happens, um, but this rotation may not be the full extent of um, the distortions that happens. So if I turn this off and I see all these manual transformations, we can kind of see what all of the different uh, transformations I can do are. So this is vertical, this is horizontal, and rotating, and then we have aspect, scale, and then offset. And you'll see that um, some of these are not very natural with how they distort a 2D image of a 3D space. Um, you can't really just extract data from nothing, but some of these uh, like automatic transformations, like level, uh, here's vertical and full. So if I go off into full, 
um, it may be um, using a combination of these kind of unnatural photo manipulation transformations. Um, and so what would happen in this case is if you get a photograph that has been modified in this way, it may be very difficult to uh, precisely match your camera and you may have to end up with making some kind of shortcuts um, or things in that nature. Uh, it just might not be exactly correct, but that is just due to the nature of the photo being artificially manipulated. So I just wanted to let you know about that. All right, next we're gonna talk about perspective, um, which I'm assuming most people um, are familiar with. But if I go into here and I open up these example photos, um, first we'll look at one point perspective. So one point perspective is when you have um, the identifying factor is if we have our um, parallel uh, lines that go left and right. So even though this is this uh, line right here is not actually going to be perfectly vertical, it's rotated, um, it is parallel. These vertical lines are parallel and also these uh, left and right lines are parallel. The ones that are not parallel are these depth lines, these ones that go into the distance towards the one vanishing point, and which makes it a one point perspective photo. And then let's see, an example of a two point perspective photo is, I guess that one that was just open. But what we can see here is that these um, vertical lines here are going to be, um, they're gonna be parallel again. And this is before distortion correction has been applied, by the way, but just imagine. Um, and then these depth, um, sorry, these depth perspective lines are going to be going towards a vanishing point. And then the other lines that are going to be going into this vanishing point are going to be our um, left and right lines, which may not be super obvious in this scenario. But if I go to, this is the same two point perspective image, just lens corrected. If I draw a line here, um, roughly, I'll do, I'll do it here actually. If I roughly follow these left and right lines here, you'll see that they're not parallel. They're kind of converging together. And it's, it is very slight, so that vanishing point is far away, but that makes it a two point perspective image. And the reason it is not a one point perspective image is because we are no longer looking square um, towards the um, that first vanishing point. So in that first image, we're looking straight this way. So that makes it so that our lines like this are gonna be um, fully parallel. Um, and this is our one point here. And then if we have a two point, that means we're generally gonna see kind of like two walls and so in this case, this is a not so extreme version, but we have non, um, we have converging lines that um, are gonna go on the, so these, these lines are gonna converge. So converging, converging, but then all verticals are still gonna be parallel for a two point perspective. And then a three points perspective, um, as I'm sure you are aware, is going to be um, basically this scenario, but then if our camera is looking upward or downward. So in this scenario, our camera is uh, level, but if we move it up or down, now all of a sudden our vertical lines um, are also going to be converging. And that vanishing point may be far away, but they're still converging. So those are the two, three types of perspective. Um, and those are going to be um, kind of how we're gonna be determining how we set up our um, camera mesh uh, based on what type your image has. So something to keep an eye out for is to keep an eye out for um, if you have a two point perspective image, but it appears as though it is a three point perspective, but in reality it's not. So for this photo, I originally was thinking it might be a three point perspective image. And that was because if I drew a, um, a vertical line right here, that vertical line, you can see there's some distortion up here. Um, and then if I were to move this over, I guess if I rotate it over here, that 
line would be skewed. I guess basically if I just rotated this line, it would line up with this wall more. Um, and same on the other side of the image. It does not line up perfectly. Um, so be careful. In this case, it is a combination of things. So the first thing that could trick you into believing that it is a three-point perspective when it's actually just two is um, optic distortion. So um, we can remove that with our previous technique. So here's our undistorted version. But you'll see it is still um, slightly off. So the next thing that could uh, lead you to believe it's three-point because of these vertical lines not being parallel um, is the fact that the construction of the actual objects may not be like exact. So these are just like laid old bricks. So when they're laying these bricks, it may just be that they um, were not perfectly, you know, um, normal to the um, ground. You know, they might just be a little bit skewed. So that could be part of it. And then another part that might make it so that it appears to be three point perspective when it is indeed two point perspective is going to be that aforementioned photo manipulation um, in where a photographer of this photo might have gone to something like the camera raw filter and then gone ahead and oh sorry they might have gone to that camera raw filter and gone ahead and messed with those geometry settings which kind of artificially messes things up um, just like I mentioned before so this something like this these kinds of transformations um, obviously more subtle might have made it so that it's hard to tell if this is a two-point or three-point perspective but it is actually just a two-point perspective image so be careful for that all right so uh, one last thing before we start going into actual perspective matching is something called the principal point of an image so if i take a image um, like this one my principal point and so this is raw for my camera my principal point is going to be in the center because that is kind of where um, that's the principal point of the image. That's where my perspective all kind of goes to. And that also occurs for non, um, non one point perspective images. So my principal point is still gonna be in the center of this image because it is raw from the camera and uncropped. Something that you cannot count on is the fact that a photo will be uncropped though. So let's say I'm a photographer and I take this photo, but I actually want uh, to only put out this much and I crop it. Now what I did is I actually evenly cropped this image so my principal point remains the same. But let's say for whatever reason I really like the corner of this of this image. So I want to actually crop this, um, I want to crop just to this corner and I want to publish this online. So my new image would look like this. So it's just the corner of this room. So would the principal point be in the center of the cropped version? It actually would not be. It would be where the original image's principal point was. So if I undo that crop, you can see that this corner lines up with that original principal point. So the principal point of the cropped image is going to be the top left corner. Um, but that just happens to be convenient where this crop lined up with that top left corner. In reality, I could crop it like this. I could crop it like this. And then that principal point could be anywhere. Since I took this photo, I know where that um, principal point is gonna be. But if I have a photo that is not guaranteed to not be cropped, I do not necessarily know where that principal point is going to be. So that will come into play a little bit later. Um, one other thing is when you're taking photographs um, with a lens, um, let's say with an, my camera, an APS-C sensor, um, that is going to originally be a, the aspect, the ratio of that sensor is the same as the full frame, which means it's a 1.5 times uh, ratio. So that means this width is 1.5 times the height. Um, that is not the same uh, ratio for a 16 by nine or like a 1080p or 720p um, image. So sometimes you can crop in that sensor. So if I set this to 16 by nine, you can see it crops the top and the bottom. And if I hit enter, um, this will be a crop, this will be cropping the sensor. Um, and that can sometimes come straight out of the camera or you can crop it later on in post. But that principal point is the same. 
the kind of crops that we have to be worried about is um, when we are not the ones doing the cropping ourselves, And that is going to be when we just receive a random image online like this one. And we could say, oh, the point's in the middle probably. But we actually have no way of knowing what this original image looked like. Um, and so that crop point, uh, we don't know where it is. We could assume, because this is a one-point perspective, that it might be somewhere around here, but we don't know for sure. And it's especially harder to tell if we have a two-point perspective image. So we'll, that'll come into play, and I'll explain all that in a bit. All right, I'm going to show the cropping in 3D really quickly. So first, I'm going to hide these um, ones right here and only have this non-cropped version. So this is going to be a camera, and then this plane would be a the shot from it and the aspect ratio of this is 1.5 by 1 so this is a full frame um, shot right here and so if I bring in this camera um, I did move it forward a little bit um, just so it can be seen easier but um, we could also say we'll just turn this one off so we only think about this one this one is going to be cropped to 16 by 9 but that principal point where that camera is staring down the middle is still going to be the same. So if I have this and this, these cameras are still staring down that image the same way. Um, so that principal point is centered because all we did was crop the top and bottom and we didn't change and we did it kind of uniformly. So this is that example where I just cropped the bottom right though. So in this case, what we're gonna have is we're gonna just be looking at this image. So um, our screen would be full of just this. This is our image. We don't actually know where this principal point is. So in reality, our camera is actually staring down. This is our blue camera here. Uh, our camera is staring down the top left corner, just like in that Photoshop folder or document, how I showed you this crop uses this top left corner. And this is just a random example of a crop. Um, but this, uh, this camera is actually just showing here. So if we look at the frustum of the camera, if you don't know what that means, the frustum is essentially like a plane along its viewing point. So this would be a frustum. So these lines kind of draw all of the possible planes. And I can actually just set the depth here. And you can see uh, I can go between different frustums uh, or at different distances. Um, but this frustum goes straight out from the camera because this is where it was originally taken. And same for this one, even though it is cropped at the top and bottom. This one, the frustum is actually all skewed. And that's because the frustum of this image would actually be the frustum of this uh, uncropped image. Um, uh, but in 3D, all we wanna see is this cropped, all we have access to is this cropped version. So the frustum of the camera is gonna be skewed. The frustum of our digital camera, I should say, is going to be skewed so all that we can see is this cropped segment. Um, and that is gonna be done with our um, camera options. It's gonna be done with our film offset. And we'll talk about that more later. But essentially what you should see is that this frustum is skewed, but the camera is in the same location because this photo was taken of this entire part and cropped to this area. So what's important is that we know where that principal point is because this principal point is still right here in the middle of this larger plane. Um, that might not always be the case, but we'll talk about that more later. All right, next what we're gonna do is we're gonna use uh, a program called FSpy. Um, and so that's gonna be a nice way of drawing lines on our photo to match the perspective. So one thing that is a little bit annoying is that um, FSpy, once you are done in FSpy, the only way that you can get it into Maya is to first bring your camera into uh, Blender. So Blender is not installed on the GNOME computers, um, but what we can do is we can actually install a portable version of Blender, um, and we can do this without administrator privileges. And what we're going to do is we're going to go back to our Z drive. And so um, once we have this downloaded, which I already do in my downloads folder, and this downloads folder could be anywhere else for you. It's probably on your C drive. Um, but anyways, what you do is you get your blender.zip. That's what we will get here. And you hit right click, extract all, and hit extract. And that might take a while. I think it took 15 minutes for me. But when that's done, you'll get this folder. And I'm going to control C, copy that. And I'm going to paste it right onto my Z drive. 
And while that loads, um, what we're going to do is we're going to use Blender, which we can now run from this folder once it's done extracting, um, after we use fspy. So once this is done, we'll let that rest for a second, and then we will do um, the fspy install. All right, so this Blender file is now in our Z drive. So let's go back to our downloads, um, and then let's go to this website that I have linked here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna click on this version that says fspy 103win.zip. Click on that, and that will download a zip file. I already have it downloaded, so I'm gonna cancel it, but we'll go to our downloads, and then we're gonna go ahead and uh, once again, right click, extract all, extract. And then we're gonna take that extracted folder, which this you'll get this once that's done, paste it into your Z drive. All right. And then um, final thing we'll do for now, go to this website that I'll have linked, click on this SPY Blender 103.zip, download that. And then what we'll do is in our downloads, this time we're not going, this is the only one of those three, or of these three that we're not going to, um, sorry, it's this one. This is the one that we're not going to extract. We want this to stay as a zip. But anyways, for now, we can go to our extracted SPY folder Scroll down and open fspy.exe. And then now go to your file explorer. And then we're gonna to go to our image that was undistorted. And so we either undistorted it with our EXIF image data using one of our three techniques, or we kind of eyeballed it without our EXIF image data using either Nuke or Photoshop. So um, whatever technique you used before, we're gonna have that image. Um, so we're gonna go to source files. And then now we have our um, we're gonna go with one point perspective first. So we have our examples. All right, so this is our undistorted version of our one point perspective. And so this is gonna be the case if your photo is one point perspective. If your photo is two point perspective, use the two point perspective method. And if it is three point perspective, use the three point perspective method um, accordingly. All right, so if your image is one point perspective, uh, the first thing we wanna do is hit number of vanishing points one. All right, and then so what we actually want to do is we want to have our left and right axis, which is this really long one. It's the one that we only have one of. We want that to be our X axis. And then um, these ones, which will disappear into the distance, these we're gonna set as our Y axis. And so you may be confused because in Maya, that would be our Z axis, but in Blender, that's gonna be the Y axis. And so we're gonna bring this setup correctly for Blender and then from Blender, it will export correctly to Maya. I'm gonna turn off dim image, and then the other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to my camera data, and I'm either going to select my camera from here if it's in this list, or I will type in my sensor size that I found from Google. So um, this was shot on the 23.5 by 15.6, and the focal length is already 24. So set that correctly. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna find a major um, kind of left and right line that spans the image. And I'm gonna take this one axis, which is axis two, and I'm gonna bring it over here. And then I'm gonna hold the shift key to bring a zoomed magnifying glass and get it lined up so that I can get this line perfectly across here. All right, and then next up, what we're gonna do is we're going to take our um, Y axis that disappears into the distance and this one we have two of, so we're gonna set this to um, along lines that dis that vanish towards our vanishing point for our y-axis, at least it's the y-axis in Blender and fspy. So I'm gonna use shift and get it along the perspective lines of this wall. There we go. And you can see it's vanishing right there. All right, and then so now we're gonna have this kind of origin and this will be where our grid is. So I'm just gonna place it on the ground here in this corner, just conveniently. And then the thing we wanna keep out, make a look out for is that our Z axis is blue and it's pointing directly up. Our X axis is red pointing to the right and our Y axis is green and it's pointing away from us. And then um, actually before I let this thing rest here, I'm gonna just kind of bring it up to lines and make sure that they match. So this is a vertical line. Let's make sure our vertical lines match. They do match pretty well across the board. And then let's use this X line to match our left and right lines. So that matches, that matches, 
matches, matches. It all matches pretty well. And then our Y green line, let's make sure that matches on the left and right lines. And yeah, that matches everywhere pretty well. So I'm gonna move this back to where I want the ground to be. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna save this. So file, save. And I'm gonna save this as our um, one point uh, perspective. And then this is on my 24 millimeter um, Sony APS-C lens. So you can kind of name this whatever you want, um, but that is what I'm gonna call it to remember what it is. And so um, that is gonna be if we have an uncropped one point perspective image. So um, before we move on to two point perspective, let's see, um, there's a possibility that our image would be cropped. So that would happen um, if we've kind of, we've removed our distortion our optical distortion and we've kind of made sure that our um, we've looked at our image and we've seen that everything is exactly lined up so we want to make sure that these are very precise and that we have chosen good vanishing point lines so these are these two are good options because they uh, can point to each other they're not super close to each other they're kind of um, uh, they kind of point together um, and so everything is lining up in this case, but let's say we were in a scenario where our um, midpoint was not at the center, and that would be a case, like I mentioned before, if this was a cropped image. So um, if our lines are not lining up here, um, which they are right now, so this is not an example of this, but this would be what you would do if you did have this example. Let's say this line is not lining up. One thing you could try to do is see if changing the location of your midpoint works. So um, if I were to set my midpoint location here, that means that this is the center of the uncropped image, which means from here to the right side, there's actually from here to that same distance to the left side in the original image. And that can kind of change um, how things will line up. Um, and so if I move this around, it's obviously not gonna line up everywhere now like right here it's off uh, because the image midpoint in this particular image is actually in the image midpoint, or sorry, the principal point is the image midpoint. Um, and one other thing that you'll notice is uh, when I did that, um, the axis got flipped. So even if you're not changing this point and your axis ever gets flipped, or if you're, so you always want green away, blue up, red right, if you ever don't get that combination, um, keep these at the values that they are, but see, or like the axis that they are, but see if flipping Y um, or X results you in what you want. So like negative X, negative Y. In this case though, I do want the principal point in the midpoint because it's not cropped. And I do want um, just positive, positive because up, away, right. So this is how I do the uh, one point perspective. All right, this is an example with two point perspective and this one is uncropped again. So our image midpoint or our principal point, sorry, is going to be our image midpoint. So once again, I'm gonna turn off dim. And then this time I'm gonna go and head and make sure it is gonna be two vanishing points. And so yeah, it, it is undistorted or at least the optical distortion is gone. So let's set this up correctly. So X um, should be left and right. So let's line this up with left and right perspective lines. So this time we have two because now these lines should converge. Even if they're pretty close to parallel, they will converge eventually, even if it's really far away. So I'll use this carpet um, as my next one because they are kind of far apart and they are um, kind of defined clear lines. You wanna make sure that the objects you're using as your perspective lines are actually gonna be lining up with the perspective uh, let's say if there's a cabinet here, um, if that's the only choice, you can use that, but there's a chance you know, that it's pushed forward on the right side by one inch, and then all of a sudden your perspective is off by a, a degree, and so now you're not gonna get a perfect match. So be careful with trying to use only objects that are kind of static, like on the ground um, and on the uh, roof and walls. So now let's set our uh, Y. So let's use this one up here. All right.
right and then we can use this one this is a little bit warbly um, which I'm assuming is just poor construction quality but on the straight edge we might be able to get away with using it alright there we go alright and so the difference one of the differences between two point and one point perspective is now we can actually see what it thinks our focal length is um, based on what we've given it so if we check this focal length box Let's set it to what we know our sensor size is, 23.5. And since this image has EXIF data, we actually know this value. It's gonna be 24. So that means our where our lines are are slightly off right now. Um, so because it's giving us a value of 23, so what we can do is kind of just like adjust these until it gets closer to what we know our actual focal length is. Because in reality, it should give us our actual um, amount but you know, if it is gonna be a little bit off, um, but it's really close, don't be too worried about it. So 23.8, I'm probably gonna be fine with that. And then let's position our uh, origin again. Um, you can kind of put this wherever, but I am gonna just anchor it to a point where I know, um, which is on the ground. And then it's gonna be next to this pillar. And so the things to keep in mind is that we set our sensor size we want our, uh, since we have EXIF data, we want this to be pretty much a match um, to what we know the focal length is. If we don't have that focal length, what we can do is um, just match it using this technique anyways. And then we can just um, assume that whatever that value is close to is the focal length that it was taken with, even though we weren't provided with that originally. Um, and so once again, this is a uncropped image, so our image midpoint is our principal point. Um, but what we can do is, if this was cropped, um, and let's say either our lines were being very off or our um, focal length was off, one of the possible scenarios for fixing this could be trying to find, just basically by guessing, um, until this value gets close and our lines start matching up. Um, we can guess where our midpoint was before it was cropped. Like I said, this image is not cropped, um, but if it was, we could try and get it closer using that technique. Um, or there would be a chance if anything, if everything's not lining up, and even after doing the the midpoint or principal point changing, there's a chance that it was just artificially uh, distorted afterwards with uh, the kind of things I was showing you earlier. And in that case. Um, we want to keep in mind, at least for the Intro to Maya and Nomen class, our goal is kind of to capture the essence of the perspective. Um, we don't need it to be exactly perfect. So we just wanted to capture the feel of the perspective. So let's say the image was distorted in a way where we can't perfectly capture it, um, or it was cropped and we can't find the right midpoint. As long as we have these main uh, perspective lines matching up, we're going to be fine, and we don't have to worry too much about it. Um, but yeah, so that is going to be our two vanishing point mode. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and go to the three vanishing point mode. All right, so if your image is, has three vanishing points, um, it's a three point perspective image. That means that um, all of our lines are going to converge on each other. So when you first open this, we're only going to have two sets of lines. So what we're going to do is hit principal point from third vanishing point. And so the reason that it's in this area is because um, if you have three vanishing points, you can calculate where the midpoint is, um, which means that uh, since it's a three point perspective, we will be finding where the midpoint is. Since this image is actually not cropped, uh, which we know for a fact, our midpoint um, after, after it's calculated from setting these um, three vanishing points using these perspective lines, it should be pretty much at the center of the image. And we can keep an eye on that by setting principal point to relative. And so uh, a value of one is gonna mean um, all the way to the side. So 1.8 on Y means the principal point is currently way up here uh, above the image. And that's because these lines were just randomly placed everywhere. Um, but a value of 0 0.5, 0 0.5 will be the exact center. So we wanna be, um, because we know that this image was not cropped, um, we should be able to get, if we match these lines accurately enough, we should be able to get that value to 0.5 and 0.5. And then our focal length, once again, we know what our sensor size is. Um, so we're gonna set that. 
And once again, this focal length value should be pretty close to 24 because we know that that's what it was shot with. Um, and so this is assuming that you have our EXIF data and that we know that our image was not cropped. If we don't know either of those, what we can do is we can still match with these three point perspective mode and just kind of see if everything lines up. And if it's not lining up, we can just try to keep tweaking. Um, and we just wanna make sure that it is indeed a two point perspective image, or sorry, indeed a three point perspective image and not just a two point perspective image that has some distortion that is leading us to believe it is three point. Um, like I mentioned earlier, but um, for this image, it is certainly three point perspective. Um, so what we're gonna do is just kind of go ahead and set it up and you would follow the same process even if you don't have EX, EXIF. Um, just EXIF allows us to kind of verify that we're doing everything correctly. So I'm not gonna dim the image. And then I'm gonna put these um, X axis, I'm gonna put that on the left and right again, the left and right perspective lines. So there's one there. And then we're gonna go ahead, I'll put this one there. All right, and then we're gonna do our Y axis, again, um, because this uses Blender, um, kind of the space. Our Y axis is away from us, and our Z axis is up. And we will correct that once we export from Blender, but for now, we'll just deal with it. Um, so I'll try and get this accurate. And so just in case I didn't kind of make a point of this, you really wanna make sure that you get a correct camera match. Um, so you wanna be pretty precise with these. I'm doing it a little bit fast just for the example, um, but it'll be a mixture of just doing this and then bringing it into Maya, uh, which I'll show you how to do soon. Um, just kind of doing that over and over again until you get a match that appears to be very accurate to you. Um, so yeah, we did this pretty well because like I said our focal length we're getting pretty much our EXIF focal length of 24 and because this image is not cropped we are getting that um, 0.5 and 0.5 uh, perspective or, Sorry principal point. So it's not cropped. So the principal point was in the center All right, and then now I'll show you kind of a more complex example uh, where we're going to analyze a photo and try and see how we can get it all uh, perspective matched all right, here's a more complex example. Um, and this is an example of a photo that you might find while making your midterm. This is actually the one I'm gonna use for my midterm. Um, but anyways, so let's try and match this. So we're gonna turn off dim image. And remember, this image has already gone through our process of removing the optical distortion. Um, so this is an undistorted image, uh, unoptically distorted image, I suppose. So let's see, let's analyze this. Um, first thing I want to check probably is to see if we're going to actually end up having um, a third vanishing point. So um, these uh, red lines are going to be only for left and right, but I'm just going to temporarily use them to test something. So I'm not going to use these as the final lines. These are going to go left and right, not up and down. But I just want to see um, these lines are actually going pretty much straight up and down from each other. And the only places where they're not is this brick. And as I mentioned before, um, something like brick could just have, um, it could have just been built in a way that it's not perfectly uh, correct. Or there could be some remnants of that optical distortion since this brick is on the edge of the image. Um, or uh, another scenario is this image might have been manipulated um, in a software like Lightroom or Photoshop, like I mentioned. But either way, I'm gonna go ahead and say that these lines are pretty much parallel. So I'm gonna say that it is just a two point perspective image. I'm not gonna go with the third vanishing point. So because it's two point perspective, let's put these red ones on the left and right here. All right. And our other one is here. Let's find another left and right um, area. So like here, for example, this is a carpet. Um, and this is kind of what I was talking about earlier. Even though this does appear to be lining up nicely, this carpet might not be perfectly exactly measured to be in perspective. So we're not gonna use the carpet. Instead, I can actually see below here, there's a little bit of that wall that we can see. So we, see, we can see the bottom of the wall. So I'm gonna use that um, for our X. And so now let's do our um, Y, which is our depth, because again, we are using our um, we are using Blender uh, dimensions in FSpy, and then we'll convert it after we export from Blender to Maya. So 
So once again, I could use this carpet, but it might not be perfectly square. So I'm gonna do a safer bet and use this kind of built-in cabinet thing as one of my lines. And then let's see, other line. Our other line is here. So let's see, I'm not seeing too many great options for this one. I could use this brick up here, but that could be a little bit just off because it's brick and not like exactly correct. So I'm gonna use the shelf instead and that could also be just the same scenario where it's also not exactly correct, but it should be fine um, enough. So let's go ahead and use this um, uh, origin kind of thing. And we're gonna just gonna measure this against our lines and see if they're more or less lining up. And so those are lining up on Z lining up, lining up, kind of lining up, could just be the brick, could be some other distortion like we mentioned, and then even back here lining up. Um, and then so like we mentioned, um, this is not currently the correct orientation. So Z is down, we want Z to be up. And then normally, or I think always, you'll have two wrong. So our X is left, but it should be right. So that means that we want to change our X um, to negative x and then that will also make our z go up as well so we want our x to the right y backwards and then z up and so I would spend a little bit more time um, within this um, going ahead and um, making sure these are exact and then do a few tests of bringing this into Maya which I'll show you how to do next and just see if you can get everything lined up as closely as possible but again um, it is going to be really hard if you're just downloading an image on the internet um, that may or may not be cropped or distorted in different ways to get it exact. So just you want to get the feel of the perspective correct. Um, one last thing we can do is we can turn on this focal length here and see we're going to use our and this, this image we know was shot from Canon 5D from the EXIF. And we know it was from a 24 millimeter lens, not a 33 millimeter lens. So but this image is actually going to lining up with this 33 millimeter value, um, which could be because the midpoint is wrong, which means it would be cropped. So let's say if the midpoint was cropped, um, it would be over here. Um, like, so let's say this was the center of the image and it's cropped this way, you know, um, or whatever. We could get this closer to that 24 value, but then that might end up making it so that our verticals don't line up anymore, which it looks like it did in this case. So it did it over here close to that vanishing point, or sorry, that principal point, but now it's kind of messing with our other alignment. So I'm actually just gonna use that midpoint, even though there's a chance this image was cropped, because there is no way of us to really know. And even though this focal length is uh, technically incorrect, it isn't too far off. That is a little bit far, but it's not terrible. And everything is lining up with this tool. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and say that it is going to capture the feel of the perspective, even though it's not scientifically, scientifically correct, because some types of distortion, um, we won't be able to correct for in order to get the exact correct, um, value, uh, for our focal length. So we're just going to go ahead and save this out and just, um, make sure that it is good. So complex example, and I actually didn't save the other, um, examples, but I only save the one point and then I'll save this one. Um, but the process will be the same for whatever .fspy file you have. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and save this and we'll move on to um, another thing next. All right, just before we go into the next part, I'll, I'm coming back to this part um, with this distorted um, f uh, camera fulcrum. So we can actually see that the principal point where this camera is pointing is right here, but the image is here. And that means that the image was cropped to where the um, midpoint is over here. So if we go into FSPY, and let's say we did entertain the fact that this would be a three point perspective image, and we tried to line these guys up, um, we might end up with the fact that, or not the fact, just with the scenario where our midpoint is saying it's over here. So let's say, in this case, that's not lining up perfectly everywhere. So I'm, and I'm kind of feeling like it's a little bit unlikely that it was cropped that much. You know, it is, it is lining up pretty, pretty decently. So 
I guess it, w- it would be a case-by-case basis. Just in my scenario, for simplicity, I am going to go with a two-point perspective. Um, but if we are assuming that this could be a potential correct position for this uh, vanishing point, or principal point, excuse me, that means that this image was cropped so that um, this is the center of the pre-cropped image. So that means that when we import this into Maya, we will end up with a distorted fulcrum of our camera, um, where instead of the camera being in the center of the image plane, it'll be distorted, uh, which is done with the um, film offset, which will be set. And that is correct because the um, we're only looking at this segment of the image from an entire cropped image that encompasses this much. So in this case, if it's off to the left, um, there would still be a lot of image over here that is just cut out. Um, so I will go over how to set it up if you do end up opting for, or not opting for, but if you do end up in a scenario where it is appropriate to have that third vanishing point with an offset um, principal point. I will show you how to set that up in Maya as well. But for now, let's just figure out how to move the um, these files from SPY to Blender to Maya. All right, we're back in our Z drive and we're gonna go to our local Blender folder that we installed earlier and open blender.exe. That'll open pretty fast. So new file general, and then select everything in here with control shift click, except for scene collection and hit the delete key. Um, and now go to edit preferences. And now what we wanna do is install that .zip that we downloaded earlier. So that will be in our downloads. And that will be our SPY Blender 103, not SPY 103, just SPY Blender 103. Install add-on and then check this box. Now we can go to file, um, import, spy. And then now what we're gonna do is we're gonna find an spy project file, which for us it's gonna be in our project file and then it's gonna be in our um, assets from spy. And this is just the way that I set it up, but you could have it set up differently. All right, and then we're gonna hit file, export, FBX, making sure that camera is selected and so if we look in our SPY here, um, we have Z up and Y away from us. Um, and that is because Blender uses Z up, Maya uses Y up. And so if we have it set up like this, um, just like um, I recommended, we'll be able to use the settings forward, negative Z forward, and up, Y up. And then if we just set where we want this to go, we'll put this in our from SPY. And sorry, that's left over from a previous version of this recording, but we'll go render and we'll say it is a one point perspective uh, camera. So we're gonna hit export and then we will be able to use that in Maya next. All right, now we're in Maya finally and we can bring in our um, image, or sorry, our camera. So let's click on this to make two views and then let's go to file, import, and then find our FBX import. And then let's select this left view by clicking on it and then middle mouse button drag our camera into here. Let's rename this render cam or something like that, like shot cam is what McClure uses. Um, then up here, let's click on this resolution gate and then let's go to our render settings. Yours might look a little bit different if your render engine is set uh, something else, but first scroll down and you should have this area. And let's go to our image, um, which is gonna be in our, uh, this is gonna be our undistorted, ver sorry, our dis yeah, our undistorted version of our uh, image here. So this is the undistorted image. So let's go to properties, right click properties, details, 6,000 by 4,000. So we're gonna render 6,000 by 4,000. All right. And then now we're gonna go ahead and bring this image in. So click on your render camera. Before we do that, I'm gonna go ahead and click on this bookmarks button. And you'll see here, if I'm in the channel box view, so this is the attribute editor view, I'm gonna press control A, channel box view. This creates this. If I double click on that, I can rename it. I'm gonna call that CV underscore home, which means camera view underscore home. Um, basically what that means is if I'm in a panel, a view panel that looks through this camera, I can right click this bookmark and hit CV home. And what that does is snap back to the position that we saved at CV Home. So if I move my camera like this, you can see that work plane moving. If I right click and click CV Home, it goes back to where it was. 
and eventually I like to lock my camera but we can't do that yet because of a reason you will see in a second um, but anyways so let's click on our camera let's go to the attribute editor with control A and then let's go down here to the environment tab and hit create and then image name let's click this folder and then let's find our um, undistorted version that we created using our undistortion process all right and then um, if you notice it's too dark click on this view transform um, we'll have to move it up here and then go to um, untone mapped srgb and we can do this in our main viewport as well if we so please have to clear some room for it. there we go so if we do have an image um, where we do an fspy let's say in this one we decided that the image was cropped and we manually set that principal point over here which means that this is the center of the original image and that this is the cropped bottom corner we'll just put it up here for example um, what we would go ahead and do is we would go and go to our camera and then in that camera plane we would go ahead to that offset and we would this would be zero by default zero zero um, and then if we would look through that camera we would see that it would be off in this crop bottom right we'd see it does not line up with our sensor um, which will be more obvious like this there we go uh, it's not lining up with our sensor so we just want to make sure that our offset matches what we have in the um, output um, film offset which is coming from fspy so we can just copy those values in from that film offset and then those that image plane should um, line up perfectly and we can match our scene correctly all right and you'll see that this image is kind of getting clipped or cut away and that's because the camera that we're looking through on the right side is has a clipping plane which is kind of hiding the things that are too far away so the camera we're looking through on the right is perspective so let's click on perspective and then set this far clip plane to 2.5 times as much and now we can see that whole thing and it won't clip away all right uh, next step of the process is going to be um, we're going to create a layer for this reference image so if we go back to the channel box with control a we can click this button which will create a layer with the selected objects and so if you didn't see i selected this and then clicked this double click on this layer and let's name this something like background reference and then if we set display type to reference and hit save this um, plane is now part of this reference so uh, this reference layer if i press v i can hide and show everything in this layer which right now is just this plane and since this is set to R, I cannot click on it to select it. I can click to select this camera, but not that. And I can turn off reference like this, and then I can click it again. If I hit it again, it'll go to template. We don't want that, so let's click it again and go to keep it on reference. All right, now let's go ahead and match this um, correctly. So let's say uh, uh, there's a few scenarios here. So let's say our first scenario is we do not have any idea about the measurement of anything in here. So what we're going to do is we're just going to eyeball it essentially with the help of a little model. So we're going to hold space, sorry, let's hold space, go to windows uh, while holding down click and holding down space still and drag down to content browser. So we can also do that if we go to windows at the top here and then go to content browser. And then under examples, and then under modeling, under sculpting base meshes, um, there is the sculpting base meshes and then bipeds. We can find the human body. And so if we double click on that, it'll bring in a model, this human, and we can actually use this. This human is actually going to be um, 880 centimeters. Um, which is 71 inches, which is, let's see, almost six foot, I believe. Um, yeah, almost six foot tall, um, pretty much just exactly six feet tall. Um, so we can kind of use this as a guideline. So we can see here clearly that the room is too big because he is six feet tall and looks very short. Um, so for this eyeballing method, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our camera 
and we're going to just press Control G to put it in a group. And then if we click on this groups transform and go to scale, the scale will be in the center of the world. And if we scale down, what we can see on the left is it appears the guy is getting bigger. But if we look on the right, we can see this camera is just getting smaller and closer to the world. So now we're going to scale it until it looks like it's about correct, only based on how tall this guy is. And now we just see this guy, and then we can move him towards us. We can move him away from us. And to me, that looks pretty good for an eyeballing. So the next, um, I'm going to undo this now. So if, if you don't have any measurements, do not undo this, because that is the way you will do it. But I'm going to undo it just to show another method here. So I'm going to delete this guy, because I can't undo adding him. So let's say we have the measurement of, um, if we zoom in here, so I can press the, uh, I think it's the backslash key under my backspace button. And then if I hold that and right click, drag, I can zoom in and then hold that and middle mouse button drag, I can pan around. If I click on this pencil, I'm just gonna draw here and I can say, let's say I know the length um, from here to here, which I actually do. So when I shot this, I took this exact measurement. So let's say that this is exactly 59 inches across. Um, because I now know the measurement of a, kind of a plane in my scene, I can use that to my advantage. So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of that. Um, and the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a plane um, with this button here. And I'm gonna go to this, uh, in the channel box, I'm gonna click on the polyplane and that lets me set the width and height. So I don't know what one I want to use right now, so let's just set this to a big number and see what direction it is. Okay, so width is left and right. And I know the left and right um, dimension is 59 inches. Um, so I'm gonna type in 59 first, but remember Maya is in centimeters, so I can multiply this by 2.54 to get uh, centimeters from these inches. So if I write the star sign, which is shift eight and equal sign, 2.54, It'll multiply what was in there before by 2.54. And so that's 149. So now this is the, uh, if I scale it only along this axis here for a little bit, I can make it a little bit easier to see. But I don't want to scale it across the left and right axis because it is exactly the correct width. Um, so that's going to be our uh, distance um, metric, I'll call it. And then now I'm going to create a secondary plane, and I'm going to call that just ground. I'm going to hide my district metric for now, and I'm going to scale my ground up so I can see it very obviously. I'm going to go into edge mode, and then over here, I'm going to click on the 4 button to set it to wireframe. I can also click, um, it was here, and I can click here. I'm going to zoom in with that uh, uh, backslash that I talked about, and then I'm going to align this. Um, plane to that known distance. So I know it's from I know the distance from here to here. So I'm going to go here and now I have this plane that goes from here to here. And I know that that is going to be um, once it's correctly scaled, it's going to be the same as the distance metric, which I will now show. Um, right now the distance metric is actually smaller, which means that this camera um, is actually going to be, it's too far away. So this distance metric seems like it is um, too small, smaller than it actually is. So I'm gonna grab um, my camera and my ground plane and I'm gonna put it in a group and I'm gonna go to this group here. And now I'm going to go to scale and I'm gonna scale uniformly from the center. And so what this should do, you'll see on this side is um, it appears as though it is scaling up everything not in the group, which in our case is this distance metric. But what it's actually doing is it's making our camera go closer. So when the camera gets closer, that distance metric appears bigger. All right, so I'm gonna go in this right viewport, I'm gonna press Alt-5 so I can see the wireframe of the other one. And I'm gonna go back to that group and scale it down. And I wanna scale it until these planes look like they're the same width and they don't line up exactly so that's fine I'll just go to distance metric and I will just move it here and I can see it is still looks like this is a bit too big so I'm going to go back to that group 
notes and I clicked on this um, and then I hit the up arrow key and then that went to that group because it is uh, up, one, up one in the hierarchy. All right, and then I'm gonna scale down more and then let's see if this lines up. All right, and that is pretty much exact. So what I can go ahead and do now is um, go to my camera here and then drag it out. And it's important that your camera was not locked before this point because now that transformation will not be able to be applied to it if it's locked. But now that it is correctly scaled, I'm gonna hit that lock button and I can actually delete my, uh, I can delete either my district distance metric or my ground, doesn't really matter. Um, I'm gonna delete my distance metric because my ground is now the same height. And now we're gonna use our character again. So I'm gonna go to um, my windows and I'm gonna go to content browser. And I'm gonna add that human. And now if I look at this human, it actually does look like it is scaled correctly. And I know that he is six feet tall. And when I measured um, in this hallway, six feet tall was pretty much right here on this plaque. So it is actually um, pretty much perfectly camera matched um, with the correct scale. So that is if you know the metric of a, um, a, a major planar surface, you can kind of line it up that way. And then now we'll go if you know the met if you don't know the metric of any planar surface, and we'll do it with the more complicated image example. All right, so we're going to use our more complicated image example. So we're going to import that SPI project, and then just like before, we're just going to export this as an FBX, and this will be the um, I don't know render complex. I would recommend naming these a little bit better and just make sure you have negative Z forward and Y up and that's because of the way that we had this set up. Now that that's an FBX, we can go into our Maya file and repeat the same steps as before. So two pane view, file, import, complex, import, select this panel, middle mouse drag, click on this and let's go ahead and check our resolution. 2400 by 1600, so let's go set that in the render settings. All right, and we can make sure it's right up here. All right, and then let's go ahead and click on this bookmark, and then in the channel box editor, call this CV home, and we'll use that in case we mess up our camera position. Let's go in here, control A, attribute editor, create image plane, go here, find that in the source image, Remember, we're, since we camera match with the undistorted image, we want to use the undistorted image to model against. Um, it's too dark, so let's use that untone mapped. And on both sides. All right. And then this is clipping, so let's set our perspective camera to have a bigger clip plane, 25. And now we have our camera and we have this. All right, so let's say we do not have the, um, let's say we don't have any actual measurements because this is not our photo. Let's go ahead and find a object that is sitting on the ground um, that might be kind of, maybe not easy, but not hard to identify. So I'm actually just gonna use this table and I'm gonna take a screenshot of just this table and make sure it's sitting on the ground and then I'm gonna go ahead and go to uh, images.google.com. Sorry, images.google.com. And if you click on this camera image, um, when I took that screenshot, you can either save it and then hit upload here, or it should just copy it to your clipboard and you can hit control V. All right, so this time we don't wanna use like find image source because this is just cropped. This is not the full image source. We wanna use this kind of visual matches and kind of find similar types of tables. So although these have like similar designs, we can see their proportions are not right. Like this one is, this one's actually not bad, um, but something like this is too tall um, and not wide enough. Um, so let's actually go ahead and see that one that we were just on a second ago. This one is not terrible. Um, yeah, we'll go with this one. So we can see these dimensions. Um, let's see, description. 
I guess the dimensions are here. So 18 by 32 by 32. And do we have, here we go, we can actually see. So, okay, here's the diameter and here's the height. These are the actual um, good measurements. So let's go into Maya and let's create a cylinder with the, those dimensions. So if we go into here, our um, height 18 by 2.5. So remember this 18.25 is in inches, so 18.25 into cm. And then now we have the value in centimeters for the height. And then if we go back to where we were, the diameter is 31.5. So diameter is two times radius, so let's divide that by two, which is this. And then that is in inches still, so inch to centimeters and it is going to be that amount in centimeters for the radius. All right, so now that we have that, let's hold on to that for a second and let's create a grid. And let's scale it up large. And then on this left side, let's click four so we can only see the outlines. Let's go into edge mode and then let's line this up with the edges of the ground. So here we go, I'm going to line that up there just by moving it along that principal axis. And then here I can see the ground there, or the bottom of the ground there, or edge of the ground, sorry. And so now this is our ground plane, and then let's just extend it a little bit past the camera on either side, or the edges of the image, I should say. All right, so now we have a ground plane, and like we said, this table that we found lies on the ground. So let's move this. This is below the ground. Let's move it up and we can press D to move the pivot to its bottom and then snap it um, to this plane. And so it is way too small. So let's just set it like this. All right. Um, we'll just put a very rough estimate. So this is too small, but our camera and our grid right now are kind of matched, so they will be going into a group. And then that group, once again, will be scaled down. And then as that gets scaled down, this object, this table will get grow. Um, so let's go ahead and move this over here. And it's still too small. Um, and it's not actually growing in size, obviously. It just appears to be larger in our view. So let's scale this down more and see if we can get it to match kind of well, so that size looks a bit close. So let's see, I'm gonna look at the left and right side, and it's not quite. Also, I'm gonna make it so that we have more subdivisions, just so there's more detail. Um, but yeah, anyways, so still it is too small in our view, so let's continue to scale down. And then let's just keep testing this. Okay. So now I can see it is actually getting kind of close. So I'm just gonna keep moving this and sliding it on the ground, not moving it away from the ground, making sure. And so um, I can see where it touches the ground here. So I'm actually, hold up, there we go. I'm gonna line it up with where it touches on the ground. So that was my mistake a second ago. So I actually let it get too um, large in our view. So I'm gonna to go to this group and I'm going to actually scale it up now. Um, and then let's move this, slide it on the ground again. Kind of a guessing and checking game, just a little bit. But that's actually looking pretty close. Um, I just wanna make sure it's still on the ground where we left it. Getting really close, so let's just do another scale. Up a little bit and then a little bit more, I guess. Okay, and so remember, this is just the dimensions of some random similar tables, so it's not the exact same. So we have the left and right side matched, but let's get that top side matched. Um, and so we'll just actually just manually drag it down. And so you'll notice that the perspective is not exactly matched on this table here. Um, that is a little bit off here, and that is just a combination of everything with this image, um, with how we could have chosen the two point or three point, um, and how some kind of ex external distortion could have 
uh, played a part, but for, for me, for this image, I'm gonna be happy with um, the, this kind of configuration I set, because if I, let's say if I drag this up here, um, these things are gonna be lining up decently well. Um, this is just the example file, not the final file. So I don't actually wanna distort this in space. I wanna keep everything kinda of straight up and down. Um, so I did actually, I probably would go back into this fspy file and straighten things up a little bit, but for the sake of example, we'll pretend that it is lined up pretty well. Um, Cause right now what we wanna focus on is getting the scale correct. Um, which we've actually pretty much just already done because this is the real world scale from that table. And so now if we add a um, Windows content browser, if we add that six foot tall person, this should look like it is six foot tall person standing next to a table. Um, and just kind of like a short coffee table that goes to their knees, which to me seems a bit reasonable um, with those dimensions. That looks about reasonable to me. Let's see what we can make them sit on that couch we'll kind of put his feet where that couch bottom would be and then rotate him and then we'll just move him down as if he was sitting on the couch and yeah that kind of looks that looks pretty scale accurate to me um, and you can obviously tweak the scale of this group if you need to but I'm gonna keep it as that so I can now move my camera and plane out of the group um, and then once I do all that I can start blocking out my scene more um, just making sure that I'm not distorting anything too badly um, and kind of, yeah, just blocking my shapes. Yeah, it does look like, um, so for my actual scene camera match, I am gonna, I would do this one with much more precision in FSpy because you can see this is definitely a little bit off here. Um, but yeah, just essentially that that is what we would do for this part. Um, and yeah, so, that is kind of the end of all of this. Um, just a rough overview. Uh, we want to definitely make sure that we know if our image has that EXIF data. Um, we want to make our image undistorted. At least we want to get rid of the distortion from optical distortion because our CG world is going to be perfectly kind of linear. Um, and then we want to so once we use one of our methods to get rid of that um, distortion, um, we're gonna go and see what perspective our photo is, uh, one point, two point, or three point, uh, making sure that we don't fall for any tricks from weird distortion. And then after that, we're gonna see what our crop is and, and kind of just have an understanding of that. And if we don't know what our crop is, we're not, not gonna be able to tell what um, our uh, principal point is so we can kind of do a guess and check thing or we can kind of see if we want to instead opt for that three point perspective or if we kind of just want to um, just adhere to the rule that we just want a feel for that um, perspective it doesn't need to be an exact true science we just want it to feel like it is in that same space um, but yeah 